You went too far. Sorry. Meter. Meter, yeah. It's a length. Wait, length. All right. Uh, or more traditionally written when dealing with visible light, if this is in the visible spectrum, 1.122.15 nanometers. I don't think that is visible spectrum. Up until Bohr's model, they there had been enough studies that they came up with sort of empirical formulas for basically everything here. There was, if I can find my list, oh, there we go. The spectral lines, um, the Lyman series, Balmer series, Passion series, Bracket series, Fund series, and Humphreys series. These are all different series that were used to determine, well, basically they were starting to identify a light that was coming off, uh, finding elements based on the light that was coming off of them. But they didn't really have a reason for it at that point. There might have been some playing around with it, but they, in essence, came up. Bohr was the one who cracked the code. And so instead of having the six different series that I just listed off, you now have one simple formula. All right. Let's do one where we actually get something in the visible spectrum. So let's say we go from uh, first to the third energy level. How much energy is required to make it to the third? Well, the only difference is instead of one fourth, it's now one ninth. So it goes through the same process. So one, one two, three. Therefore, the frequency that changes. So that's going to change. So then that changes over here. Uh, yeah, so this is 2.91 times 10 to the 15th. 1.031 times 10 to the negative 7. Yeah, let's make it even smaller. So it went the long way there. Visible spectrum? Maybe like 400, 300 nanometers? Yeah, somewhere in that range. And I don't have that written down. Well, I should actually have some clue right here. Uh, light 
there we go. Light goes from 410 to 656 is what I have in here. Nanometers. What was our answer for the frequency? The frequency was there. 2.91 times 10 to the 15? You get into 13. Is it what the clock's counting at? 30? That's negative 34. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. I want to do one more attempt at this. Let's see if I can actually, because the Balmer series should be visible light. And so second level to let's do second to fourth. Second to third gave me you know, 6.595 to the second. Negative. Oh, okay. Negative? The negative seven. Oh, okay. So if we go from the second to third level, E2 to E3, we end up with 656 nanometers-ish. Five. 659. 659. Well, technically 660. All right, which puts it in appropriately for the color I just used, just red. All right, thank you. So we now have an explanation for spectral lines that could not be explained in classical physics. So what we have so far is that light obviously behaves like a wave, but it also behaves like a particle. So enter Prince Louis de Broglie, and uh, excuse my pronunciation, Prince Louis de Broglie, which doesn't really help the pronunciation. Say it with a French accent. Who speculates that if light can be a particle or a wave, can an electron be a particle or a wave? Have I talked about the Davis and Germer experiment in here? Let's see if I had. Sending electrons towards the double slit? I did do that. Okay. I did do light. But you're remembering electrons? You're not, you've lost confidence. <laughs> All right, so here's this again. Quantum physics is full of uh, what seem to be just purely random guesses, but we know. that energy for a light is equal to H times frequency. So we're just basically, we're starting out with the whole idea of what we know about light, and then we're going to, at some point, just go, hey, well, suppose this we're for a particle. That's gonna be equal to mc squared. I know that frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So my energy, this could be equal to HC over lambda. Well, one of the C's cancels out. M times C, that's just mass times the speed, so that's just momentum. And so wavelength is equal to H divided by P. This is known as the De Broglie Wavelength. And it's a speculation of what the wavelength of a particle is, if we just know the momentum of that particle. So if that is the case, let's just start out with an extreme, a bowling ball, 
No, that's actually a mistake. Average person walking, sauntering down the street. Average person, about 70 kilograms of mass. Uh, just sauntering down the street about, well, probably at a nice clip, one meter per second. So that would be roughly that. So we're moving at a decent pace. So therefore, what is the magnitude of the momentum of this person? Keep on. 170. Yeah. So the wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength of this person It should be 6.6 .6 to 6 times 10 to the negative 11th, or sorry, or if I actually put the correct number down, negative 34 joule seconds, divided by 70 kilogram meters per second. 9.466 to the negative 36 units. do it from this right here, it would be joule second squared per kilogram meter. A kilogram, that, a kilogram meter per second squared is a newton, so that's a joule per newton. A joule is a newton meter. There are newtons, not just meters. Or, it's a wavelength, it's meters. Obviously, incredibly small. A person just walking in a decent clip down the, in a straight line, the wavelength, it's imperceptible. We are talking about something quintillion, a quintillionth of the size of a nucleus. It's not something we can measure. However, the electrons, well, the electrons we should be able to come out with something a little bit better than that. So let's just take an electron with it. We know its mass, or we've written it down several times, and we assume that I was not lying with it. 34 kilograms is the mass of an electron. Uh, the speed of an electron, we'll keep it non-relativistic. We'll just say uh, a million meters a second. So the, the Broglie wavelength would be 626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds divided by 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms times 1 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So we're now starting to deal with things that are at least almost at a measurable level. To the negative tenth, we probably can handle. But the question is, is there any experiment that can actually test it? And yes, there is. This is the Davis and Germer experiment. See if this rings a bell to anyone other than Sarah. We talked about light apparently, but if I send an electron at it, if it's a wave, what I would expect is to see some pattern against the wall here, 
So if it's a wave where I got most in the middle, then a little bit less, dark spots. I would expect to see some pattern like that. Now in reality, what's happening here is that you send it towards it, and on the screen right here, you'll get a hit right there, then you get a hit here, and a hit here, and a hit here, more hits, and ultimately it ends up being, you get the biggest cluster in the middle, uh, smaller clusters, smaller clusters, with places where it's not hitting. So it ultimately, you have a, a screen that will light up when an electron hits it. So is that shooting multiple electrons or just one or? Yes, it works for either. If you send multiple electrons, you get the pattern, but if you send one at a time, then you also still get the pattern. So this was the Davison-Germer experiment. Davison got uh, Davison got the Nobel Prize for it. Germer just got satisfaction with having his name associated with one of the more famous experiments. All right, so had I talked about this? Is your confidence back or? Yeah. Yep. Something like that. Yeah. Or perhaps in a fever dream, you were just dreaming it that it had to be true. Does anyone else remember my talking about this? Okay, so I got some yeses and noes. All right. Germer, grad student, one of many, so that's why he did not share. He just happened to be there. All right, so now we have this, this situation where things that we consider to be standard particles can now be described by waves. The trouble is, how do you describe a, a particle like a wave? Well, first off, let's talk about one of the problems with waves. Questions before I continue to erase them? One of my professors in grad school had said he, he met the Brody, uh, and Described him as the met of the Brogi when he was a much older man. Uh, said he'd gotten a little crazy. I think was still living off the glory of his doctoral dissertation. He's the only person to win a PhD off of a doctoral dissertation, by the way. Everyone else had to do research afterwards to get it. And it was also 34 pages long, so I've been told. Whereas the usual one's about 200 pages. But he was a prince in a country where they did not have royalty. Make of it as you wish. So I'm going to draw a wave up here. I'm going to find something darker. Now let's assume that I've drawn this properly, that there is, it, let's just pretend. If I asked you to find the wavelength of this, could you do it? Assuming that this actually is position, uh, wave versus position. If I asked you to find the wavelength, could you do it? Not a trick question. If you can measure that. Yes, I guess. Okay, what would you measure? The peaks or the troughs. Okay, peak to peak or trough to trough? Yeah. If I asked you where is the wave, what would you say? How would you describe the location of the wave? Could you identify a location? Could 
give someone coordinates of where the wave is? Okay, so how would you do it if it's 2D? Or like if it was three dimensional, then yeah. How would you do it then? So it would just be constant along the line. Okay, so like you, there's not a location, there's it, it's spread out. Yeah. Okay. All right, so if you know, so if I draw it, so assuming it's regularly drawn, you can find the wavelength. Position's a lot harder to describe because it's not in a position, it's you know, spread out. Suppose instead, I had a wave that looked like that. Finding the wavelength, I would think, would be much harder. But the position's a whole lot easier. I mean, at least I can narrow the position down to a, a certain range here, as opposed to it's everywhere. So we get this duality here of the more I know of one thing, the less I know of another. So, this is leading to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Heisenberg is uh, known for this. He was also, and it's not advertised as much, but I'm pretty sure Heisenberg's the one who was in charge of the Nazi nuclear bomb program during World War II. But there's also some evidence to suggest that the uh, Nazis in the bomb program were going deliberately slow. All right, so I'm gonna do a pseudo derivation of this. I'm gonna do some hand waving at, at a couple spots, uh, but just to get the gist of it. So let's assume that we have a wave traveling along in the X direction. 